On today's episode, how to make your kid a millionaire. Welcome to the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. This is Choose FI. You're listening to Choose FI Radio. The blueprint for financial independence lives here. If you're looking to unlock the secrets to financial independence and early retirement, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and join a community of like-minded people who are getting off the hamster wheel and taking control of their lives in the pursuit of financial independence. Choose FI, your home for financial independence online. Right, guys we're going to be diving into some really epic content today discussing this concept of giving your children the tools they need to guarantee their path to financial independence and maybe as a another cool metric a millionaire how to reach that millionaire status and we're going to be really referencing an article that uh, was just published at chooseify.com we'll have a link for you in the show notes and we'll also give you an easier way to access it today as well but i should just say as a preface for that that this has been an episode that Brad has been wanting to see exist in the universe for a very, very long time, and no one really did it in a satisfactory manner. So he went to the team and asked if we could help create this. So with that, uh, Brad, how you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I'm doing quite well. Yeah, that was uh, quite the setup, certainly. And and you're right. I mean, I think when you first hear that, make your kid a millionaire, it sounds almost clickbaity, but it's it's almost a mathematical certainty. And like you said, it's about giving your kids the skills that they need, right? It's not about giving your kids a million dollars or giving your kids anything necessarily. And and we're obviously gonna gonna go into that. But yeah, I'm this just article could have been a lot shorter if that was the takeaway. Just give it to them. Just give them yeah. a million bucks. You're done. It's easy. <laughs> Hand them one million dollars and you've made them a millionaire. That's great. But no, Ray on our team and and Annie, they put together this amazing article. And yeah, Jonathan, we'll set up a, a short code for that, like you mentioned. What what should we call it, do you think? Well, Brad, I mean, I think we'll just probably make the audio episode and the video episode live on that page. So if someone wants to access the article and go back and watch the video podcast, they can just go to choosethefy.com slash 319. We will, we'll make that happen. But Brad, I mean, obviously my throwaway statement around, just give it to them. No big deal. I think all of us kind of have this realization that if we do that, yeah, in the short term, we achieve the objective, but we probably ruin them. Likely, if, if that was the scenario, there, there's no knowledge that's really been imparted, no life lessons. And, you know, the whole making a million dollars is the key to the success. I mean, it's a, that actual journey where you go through the process of finding out how do I accrue wealth, not burn it. Yeah, you're right. I mean, I, I think this is I mean, for so many of us, right, like this is the story of Phi. for us. It was for most of us. It was make a lot of mistakes, fumble along blindly until you find some information. In a lot of cases for us, it was finding the FI community. You know, for me, it was finding Get Rich Slowly and Mr. Money Mustache and JL Collins. For a lot of people listening, it's uh, amazingly, it's finding us, right? It's finding this community and learning that there is a better way and that you don't have to spend all your money, that you can understand the power of compounding, right? Like what it means, how plausible it is to become a millionaire over a 15, 20, 30 year period of time, what you have to put away each month to make that doable. I think so many of us shut down when we hear large numbers. You know, I, I, I constantly rag on Susie Orman a little bit here with her to retire. You need $10 million. Well, I'm not going to ever have $10 million, you know, Jonathan, in all likelihood, you might not have $10 million, right? But like that, where you, you've got a funny, funny look. I, I do. Face. I want to interrupt you so bad just because it. it's, it's worth it. I promise there's a payoff here. I, I sent a message to you and Ed uh, just earlier this week. Susie Orman it has just dropped. Apparently someone in our community shared this with us, has dropped a course on how to reach financial independence. <laughs> and I tell our audience, like, here's, I'm going to give you a secret. You don't need to take the course. Here's the secret. Just work until you're 140 years old. Like that's it. According to, you know, you'll be able to reach the number that Susie thinks you need to hit. And with total financial security, just work till you're 140. You don't need to take the course, but I'll give you the link just in case. 
Oh, that's well, yeah. So for anybody who doesn't know what we're talking about, <laughs> Susie Orman famously appeared on uh, Paula Pan's Afford Anything podcast and essentially said she despises the financial independence community and concept. So it's it's somewhat ironic that she's now uh, touting a a paid product to become financially independent. So, you know, it's it's somewhat ridiculous. And, I, you know, to me, again, going back to mindset, I, I think so much of this journey comes back to mindset. And when you believe something is possible, when you believe that your own agency can make your life better, then you are emboldened to make change, right? That is why people listen to this podcast. That's why people sign up for the newsletter. That's why people join the Facebook page because they see people making changes in their lives that are making them better. And that is inspiring, right? And when you see that, when you believe that you can make change, then you start, right? And Jonathan, we've had a couple episodes in, the, in a row now on life hacks and 1% better. And it truly does start with those 1%. It starts with little things. And then your life just magically, you know, kind of jokingly, magically gets better, right? Like you start compounding these things. And again, maybe in a couple months time, you're going to see a little improvement. But damn, if over 10, 15, 20 years, like, you are going to wake up and be wildly wealthy because of individual changes you made. I mean, we've talked about this over and over again, even again on, on episode 318, we talked about just the difference in me driving old cars is going to be a nearly three quarter of a million dollar decision in my lifetime just for driving old cars. It's not like I'm walking places, right? Like I'm not hitchhiking. I'm just driving a slightly more used car than most people are driving. So it's cool when you can rethink this to, hey, what would it take to become wealthy? What would it take to become financially independent? What would it take to reclaim my time? And again, I think that is the most empowering message you could ever come up with. Yeah, I agree on the empowerment. And I think then it's time to kind of stretch the tactics that we talk about and apply it to that young mind, right? And to that different age bracket than we normally focus on. Most of us think about our investing timeline as 30 to 45 years. That's typically what we talk about in terms of, you know, what you could expect and a lot of these trajectories and where you'll be are based around 30 to 45 years. But most of us kind of think about that in terms of starting at the age of, you know, 20 as an adult, maybe a young adult, but an adult, you know, out in the world making their own financial decisions. What does it look like? How early could you really get started if you understood the framework or the rules and you took this message of empowerment and you applied it to a, an individual that's willing to take action being guided by their parent? So Brad, I think, you know, you talked a little bit about, and I think I'd like to go farther with this. Why plan for retirement at such a young age? They have their entire life ahead of them. They've got their twenties and their thirties and their forties to break stuff and figure it out and do better. Why start planning or having these conversations with, with your children at such a young age? Yeah. So I think for me, it's a dual prong thing. I think actually planning for retirement might be like a slight variation on the conversation that I would personally have. So I think I would couch it under the concept of we're going to use a retirement vehicle. And obviously I'd explain this in, in, in words that my, my kids would understand. I wouldn't use retirement vehicle, but you see this gonna... hot rod car. This is the vehicle. <laughs> we don't want the station wagon. <laughs> we want the hot rod. Cause that's not going to make it on the loop to loop. <laughs> yep. So I, I think, uh, and again, you know, Jonathan, I love your, your input on this. Like to me, I think one of like the biggest kind of misdirections or one of the biggest misses, frankly, about saving money generally, whether we're talking about for kids or for adults, even, you know, young adults or even, you know, people in their thirties, forties and beyond, like, is this concept of saving for retirement, mm. because it seems so far off. It seems like that future self, even if you love that fictional, you know, that future self, like. It's hard to spend your current life just around like catering to that three decade future you. Whereas I think the concept of financial independence is what would get people to take action. That concept of you can control your time, you have autonomy to make decisions. And I think we use retirement vehicles. And again, those are, you know, that's a very fancy way. And I hate using jargon, but that's a fancy way of just saying like things like your 401k. Things like an IRA or Roth IRA or, you know, 457, 403B, right? Like there are all these incredible options that, that many of us have available and you can put money in there, whether 
this is Jonathan for retirement at 70, 59 and a half or an early retirement, right? Like there are strategies to get that money out. So I think for me, the concept of, Hey, let's plan for retirement. Like that's almost beside the point, but I think it's important to know that like, man, we're going to take advantage of those retirement options to the ends of the earth, right? Like those we're going to benefit from. Does that mental framework make sense to you? I think you nailed it. Yeah. You reframed it. Nobody wants to plan for retirement. Even people in their forties and fifties don't really want to plan for retirement. It's just like a word that's more accessible and sounds more in reach. And it feels like it's what's supposed to be the next thing, but no 20 year old wants to plan for retirement and certainly no eight year old, seven year old, you know, teenager is even that word isn't even on their radar. What we might be willing to do is to plan out our life, our life, right? And financial independence is a better framework for talking about what do you want to do with your life? How do you want to give yourself as many options as possible? How do you want to take whatever strings, you know, a system has on you to, you know, do X, Y, Z, remove those to give yourself an unlimited option to choose from. That's why I think you're right. First thing is like, let's lose the term retirement. No parent should go in talking to their kids about what, how they're going to have enough money when they're 65. They don't care. They'll never care. I still don't care right now. You know, I'm planning for intermediate time periods. I'm planning for my life. My life does not include even the word retirement, to be honest with you. I might not be working, but the retirement isn't something that means it. it's just, what am I doing at this particular stage of my life? Well, whatever brings me the most joy because I've unlocked options. And yeah, hundred percent, Brad, you nailed that. And you also, I think we're right to point out, okay, we're planning for our life. We want to give ourselves the best chance to have as many options as possible. What are the tools that give us that? We got to look at what's out there and the framework, the system that we're all working inside has a few that can aid our desire for more options. And some of those are retirement planning tools. And so, yeah, some of these conversations at some point are going to include that. And so Brad, in this article that we're referencing, which you can find at chooseify.com slash 319, they put a lot of emphasis early on on the Roth IRA. And I'd be curious, you know, from your perspective as a former accountant and lifelong Excel nerd, why the Roth IRA? Yeah. So this is, I think to me, and this is why I wanted to see this article come into existence is that there has never been a great explanation of how people can take advantage of children who have earned income being able to contribute to a Roth IRA. And Jonathan, you and I have mentioned this very much in passing, maybe two or three times over 400 plus episodes. And it's always been one of those things that like, I think is, is this amazing potential life hack, if you will, that if you Google around for this, like no real phenomenal resource exists for it. So we wanted to put it into the world basically. So the key here is that most kids who are 10, 11, 12 years old don't have a job that enables them to contribute to a 401k, right? Or 403b or 457. Most of the different options are simply unavailable for them. So if they have some money that they've saved, whether through jobs or through presents or whatever it may be, like their options are very, very limited. But the one incredible option that they do have available is the Roth IRA. So Jonathan, as you know, Roth IRA is an after-tax contribution. So this would be an after-tax contribution that they made. And the money then grows tax-free forever. It can be pulled out in the future. You know, if we're talking about like a 12-year-old, theoretically, let's even just assume normal, normal distribution they can access it at 59 and a half. So you're talking 47 and a half years of compounding, which is truly remarkable. And we'll, and we'll certainly show some examples of that later in the episode here. But I think that's the key is that this is in a vehicle that then that grows again, it's, it's tax rate because that money has been taxed up front. And you know, that's, that's a separate issue, which we can also refer to that's in the article a little bit. There's, there's some nuance there and, you know, clearly this show is not tax or investing advice. So obviously you have to look into your own situation. I know I hate giving disclaimers, but it's very important that we give that disclaimer. Absolutely. Nobody would look to this show for tax or investing advice. I don't <laughs> even know why you would be here. Like <laughs> Susie Orman, no. probably. I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so that's, that is almost like, we'll put that to the side, you know, regardless, that's something you need to look into for yourself as far as like the requirements for 
taxation for that earned income, et cetera. But, but we can talk about the real meat of this, right? So this money has already been taxed and then it grows tax-free forever. So you're not paying, if this was in a regular investment account, even if, you know, your child had the wherewithal or, or you taught them and it was in a regular investment account, all of the dividends and capital gains distributions over those intervening 47 and a half years and beyond, those would be taxable. And the sales, when you went to sell it, you know, 40, 50 plus years later, you know, over what you bought it for, that's a capital gain. It's subject to capital gains tax as well. So this cuts all of that out. It just compounds tax-free. And when you pull it out, tax-free also, because it's in a Roth IRA. So Jonathan, that to me is the reason why, like, this is a remarkable thing. So clearly there's lots of like lessons that we can talk about teaching your kid, but the actual mechanics, it's if you have earned income, you can put that money into a Roth IRA. You can put up to that money. And we will talk about that also. That's an important, important distinction. But let's say you earn $5,000 of earned income. You can put $5,000 into a Roth IRA. So the, the current limit for Roth IRAs is $6,000 a year. And that's always, you know, that it seems to go up every, every couple of years. So you need to keep, keep abreast of that certainly. But yeah, that's the cool thing here is earned income and it can go into a Roth IRA, which then compounds and grows for decades, multiple, multiple decades tax-free. Hey, this is Andrew from the Choose FI team. I hope you're enjoying the show. We're going to get right back to it after these quick messages. So, you know, as you're saying this, I think it's really, you know, people hearing that are probably getting very excited about the Roth IRA and like, well, my goodness, I've heard a lot of episodes that you guys have done and you haven't like leaned into the raw. I mean, you've definitely talked about it, but you haven't talked about it as the first place that we go to invest. I think it's important to really consider the distinction between an adult that is making maybe a median income, maybe an above median income, maybe a high income that has a high marginal tax rate versus, you know, a 14 or 15 year old. So Brad, why don't you just discuss why the Roth for this particular uh, age bracket and income bracket has so much appeal? Yeah, well, like you said, and and I think the the starting place is actually is that adult case in point. And there are legitimate, legitimate debates. And obviously, this always comes down to personal preference and what your situation is. This is not blanket advice, certainly. So, yeah, we have long said that really it's control what you can control. That's a phrase that we've used over and over here. And I think one of those things that you have much more control over than you otherwise would have thought is your tax rate and your tax liability. And I think a lot of that control comes from being able to contribute to pre-tax retirement accounts. You know, most of us, many of us have, have 401ks. We talked again yeah, about 403Bs, 457s, the millionaire educator, Jonathan, in episode 13, was it? talked about this and that's an amazing case study. And, you know, then you have options like HSAs, you have traditional IRAs if, if you qualify. So there are lots of ways to just lower your total taxable income, which is again, that's at your highest marginal tax rate. So there's a huge benefit to you for contributing to those pre-tax retirement accounts, especially when you're making a lot of money, there's a significant benefit. So my bias is to always try to max those out as much as possible. I think that's kind of keeps with that ethos of control what you can control and you're getting a significant benefit. And then, you know, we talk about real in-depth strategies like the Roth IRA conversion ladder, which is way beyond the scope of this. You can Google that or we uh, search on our website. We have tons of resources on that where you could potentially pull that money out tax and penalty free you know, even though you put it into pre-tax. So again, way beyond the scope of this episode, but man, there, there are some cool options. So that's why I think that's the best for many, many, many adults. But then we're talking about kids here and this is the option that they're able to contribute to. So this is, you know, not only is it, it's really the only game in town, which, you know, in and of itself by definition is the impetus to, to do it. But again, you're talking about that compounding, that tax-free compounding for those decades. I mean, goodness, that's crazy. And again, you know, then we get into the Jonathan, the territory that's a little harder to talk about with the blanket statements about, you know, the tax filing requirements for kids and do they have to file their own return? Does some of the income go on parents' returns? You know, that's, 
that's a separate issue. But I, I think if they are filing their own return, then, you know, I think what you were getting at with this is that their income is going to be tiny, right? It's only going to be a couple thousand dollars. So their tax rate is going to be significantly lower. So just from like a, a normal standpoint of the Roth IRA decision point, I think this is the more pertinent topic because, you know, again, it, it's kind of hard to talk specifics, but for adults, when you're talking about like, Hey, what's the decision point between a Roth IRA and a traditional? Well, if you're at a low tax bracket, a low marginal tax bracket, because let's say your income is low this year or, you know, whatever, whatever it may be, you could make a strong argument. That would be the, the argument to contribute to a Roth IRA then, because sure, you're paying the tax on it, right? We say it's after tax money, but you're paying a tiny little tax rate. So of course you'll lock that in because who the heck knows what the tax rate's going to be in a couple decades when you go to take that money out. So I think that degree of certainty gives a lot of people, you know, just some real satisfaction that they can lock that in. So I think that's kind of like the overall thought process here. Yeah. And I just, you know, in terms of the only game in town, what we're, when we say the only game in town in terms of retirement vehicles, we're talking about, yeah, they don't have access to a 401k, right? They, they, they have access to the IRAs and they can pick between a traditional IRA or a Roth IRA. Th those are their two options. So do you want it to be pre-tax? Do you want to go in post-tax because of the relatively low marginal tax bracket that they will find themselves in? Because again, to Brad's point, you're probably talking about a sum of money between $500 and $6,000 and probably the very, very high end. The relatively low sum of money that they're going to be earning, it is going to be likely in their best interest to just go ahead and pay the small amount of tax that will be owed on that and get that into a vehicle where it is then sheltered from tax for you know the rest of their their life. So if we kind of say that's kind of table stakes and that's why we're, we're talking about it, we then need to actually talk about what does earned income actually look like? And most of us think about like our, our allowances. And this is a big thing to, to say that allowances do not count towards earned income. So you cannot pay your child for making their bed 50 cents a day, 50 cents a week, whatever it is, and have that you know add up to be that amount. There is some clauses in here if you really wanted to push the limits. And, you know, Ray really dug into this when he was putting this article together. You know, if you can establish that you are going to hire someone to perform reasonable duties, such as cleaning the house, mowing the lawn, then potentially there are rooms. But now you're talking about a gray period. You're probably going to want to work, you know, with an accountant to establish a framework for that. But aside from that, because we're trying to, all right, no allowances, no. You know, there are step. I was hiring, you know, this landscaping company to mow my lawn, though, and now I'm paying them instead. All right, you got your paperwork filed. You know, okay, I got it. You know, you could push the you could push the limits there. But as your child gets older and now we're talking about them potentially working outside of the home, there is some narrowly defined scopes of work that you could have them consider doing that you could feel pretty confident about that would then fall into these categories. And just to kind of inspire some ideas, I'll read a couple of these off to you, like babysitting, delivering newspapers, mowing lawns for other families. So in contrast to mowing your own yard, you're actually talking about mowing lawns for other families you know, be doing some sort of actor or model type role. So photography or working for a parental owned business. So, you know, you are an entrepreneur, you've set up a business. Great. You've already laid the groundwork to have a phenomenal platform to hire your child inside your business, doing an age appropriate scope of work. And I'll give us all back to Brad just to comment on, but I should say we're talking about various age brackets, right? Because these kind of work at different levels. When your child reaches the age of 14, at that age, they are able to work under certain conditions with public and private companies, which would put them under the standard tax code. So not every company is going to hire a 14-year-old, but there may be those that have done this before or can dig into this. It then does become legal. You know, child labor laws would then allow this, and it probably will have some forms that would need to be filled out ahead of time. That's just kind of, I just, I think it's really important. You know, we did, we did a lot of non-specifics earlier. I think it's really important to provide you guys just with a general framework for how could you creatively look through some of the ideas listed to then maybe, you know, come up with your own that would then fall under these general guidelines. Brad, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that was a, a really good overview. And I, I would say the most obvious is just a regular job right? You know, let's say they're 13, 14, 15 years old. And, you know, I, I'm not sure the specifics of how old you have to be in certain states, but let's say you work at McDonald's or whatever, or just, you know, any type of store, you know, your local grocery store, 
I mean, that's, that's real income, right? I know my kids are going to be, or my, my older daughter intends to be a, an assistant swim or a junior swim coach in a couple of years. So, you know, that'll be uh, some money she earns over, over the summer. So obviously any type of real job, if you will, quote unquote, that, you know, they're getting paid for, like, that's the most obvious one. So, you know, you get into some, like you said, Jonathan, a gray area when it's for your own company. And I think people need to be really careful of not just like making up fictional income here. Obviously, uh, you know, this should be legitimate expenses that if you were going to pay somebody else, you could potentially hire your child to do it. So, you know, I would certainly make sure you dot I's and cross T's and, and make sure you document that, that this is real work that's been done. So that's, that's very, very important. So I think where this all kind of ties in then is, okay, so you, you have this earned income, right? You've calculated how much income have they earned for that year? And then what can go into the Roth IRA and what money does it have to be? And I think that this is actually an important nuance, but it, it can make an enormous difference. So hypothetically, and actually this is what Ray put in the article here is let's say we have, uh, we have Johnny. So he actually starts mowing lawns at the age of nine. He's a very enterprising little kid and, and he made uh, $4,000 that first year in, wow. in earned income. So yeah, pretty busy kid. Crushing and, it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. So let's say Johnny and, and his parents decide, okay, $3,000 is going into a Roth. And I, and I very specifically didn't say 3,000 of that, right? $3,000 is going into a Roth. So there's a bunch of different things you can do to get that money in, right? So obviously the, the most clear one is Johnny can take 3,000 of that 4,000 and just contribute it to his Roth. Another option you could say, and and this is the important nuance, is it doesn't have to be that exact money. It doesn't have to be the exact dollars that Johnny earned. It's just that because he did earn $4,000 in that calendar year, a $4,000 contribution can be made to his Roth IRA. So that means the parents could contribute it, right? The grandparents could contribute it, or the grandparents could give the money to Johnny and can contribute it. It doesn't have to be the exact dollars that Johnny earned. Does that make sense, Jonathan? Because this is really important that people understand this. Massive point. I mean, we're talking, it could be a matching program. You have It gives you a ton of flexibility just to realize that money can be used twice, basically. I mean, it can go to two different purposes. That, that's the key to what we're trying to get across here. Right. Like, so for instance, let's say you wanted to do something fun, because again, we're trying to make our kid a millionaire here, right? And a lot of that comes down to lessons. So let's say we want to do a matching program, which is awesome that you brought that up. So, okay, Johnny, you put in a thousand dollars of your 4,000 that you earned, you get to keep the other three. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to match that then two for one. Okay. So if you put in a thousand, I'm going to put in 2000 of my own money as the parent. And then the 3000 goes in, we could have done a three for one match, Jonathan, but I guess we're, we're, we're being a little stingy here. So $3,000 goes in, but again, Johnny's money is separate, right? He only took 1000 of his four. He gets to keep that other three, but we're teaching him financial lessons here in this hypothetical of, Hey, we want to incentivize you putting money away. It's, it's very similar to what companies do with a 401k match, right? Like we are incentivizing you to put in money. And we're going to match it. They're not going to match it at 200 or 300%, obviously. But, you know, they usually give a couple percent, which is free money. So, I mean, this is teaching Johnny these type of incentives of, hey, don't pass this up. This is the best return you're ever going to get. So, you know, again, that's putting $3,000 in, but the parents putting two of it in and Johnny put in a thousand, there's still room for an extra thousand because he earned 4,000. So this conceptual framework here, this is what's important to get across. Yeah. I mean, so we're going to just do some basic compound math calculations and just time value of money calculations here, but I just didn't, we don't want you to gloss by that and miss that. This is a wonderful opportunity for you to incentivize saving through conversation, bank of mom and dad, right? It's just, there's all sorts of variants on how much you do there, but just know it's based on the earned income. So you could do up to 4,000 from wherever the source. So Let's just really focus in on just one time value of money calculation, Brad, uh, you know, for Johnny here. So Johnny, if he were to take 3000 of that original 4,000 that he earned or 3000, you know, that's how much him and his parents collectively in some combination, you know, we don't, we don't really know. They actually were to fund that Roth IRA account. 
with $3,000 that first year at nine and then just never touch it again. Let's just start there. They do it the one year. Johnny doesn't want to mow the next year. He's like $4,000 of lawn mowing. That was way too, like, no, not doing that again, but that's it. But that one year, they just knocked it out of the park. What if we were to do a time value of money calculation out to more of a traditional retirement age? Yeah, we, uh, we put this into a compound interest calculator and yeah, if he put in that 3K at nine years old and didn't touch it until he was 64, which is, you know, pretty standard, standard retirement age for, for most people, he'd have almost $124,000 from just contributing that one time. So, I mean, that's, that in and of itself shows you just the power of compounding just from not from making tens upon tens of thousands of contributions, you know, but just that one $3,000 contribution is going to get him 12.4% of the way to this million dollar goal, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's that it's really starting early and having that working for him. You know, if he were to supplement that with just, I don't know, as little as 1500 bucks a year, which we're talking now, like a hundred bucks a month, you know, just, just a little bit over a hundred bucks a month for the rest of his, you know, investing lifetime, that is going to get him to a millionaire status. But it probably could have started just with this, something as simple as that early childhood lesson where we just learned, we overly incentivize getting money, you know, into that savings account. And so 1500 bucks a year is all that Johnny needed to come up with for the rest of his investing timeline to basically assure that he's going to be a millionaire at retirement. And the reason I wanted to point that out is when we don't have this money lesson, when we have the lost decade that, oh, so many of us encounter where we don't start realizing how important this conversation is until we've gone to college, we've had the student loan debt, we paid it off, we've gotten that first or second job, we finally paid off, you know, the second car, the first car. Now we're like, all right, you know, it's probably time to get serious. I'm in my thirties now. You know, I feel like maybe I should start taking this a little bit more seriously. Brad, what would be like for that person that's starting at zero at that age in their early thirties, how much would they need to invest, you know, on an annual basis to be able to get a, a somewhat similar result to what Johnny just got? Yeah. So I guess let's say you started saving at 31, which, you know, it's pretty reasonable time for, for most people to start saving and you maxed out your Roth IRA contribution. So we'll just say it's $6,000 a year. You know, it does go up in all likelihood, but let you know, it's safer to say it's 6,000. So you're putting 6,000 a year and you're contributing every year from 31 to 64. So now Johnny, remember, is going to have over a million dollars, 1,050,000 basically for just putting in a quarter of that in essence, right? $1,500 a year. But you had to max out. You had to put in four times six thousand dollars a year from thirty-one to sixty-four, and you at the end of it will have seven hundred and sixty-four thousand. So you actually have a full what quarter less uh, yeah. than what Johnny had, uh, right around there, which you know twenty-five percent less money in your pot of you know this net worth here in your Roth IRA, and you had to contribute four times you had to contribute the full 6,000. So I think, you know, that is, but one example of the power of compounding and the power of time, right? Because if you think about it and, and it looks like in this article, we use 7% for the annual growth rate. And I think, uh, we, we, Jonathan generally use 8% on the show, but 7% in all, in all honesty is, is probably it's a, a little more conservative and, and who knows what the future will bring. So I'm fine with that as an example, but if you use, and again, I don't want to get into jargon here, but there's a concept called the rule of 72. And it basically just kind of tells you how quickly your money is going to double based on the interest rate that you could expect to earn. So really, really simply, you just take the number 72 and you divide it by your expected interest rate. And that gets you the number of years to double. So just really simply, we'll say on average here, we're talking 10 years, right? 72 divided by seven comes out to 10 and a little bit of change. So your money would double in 10 years. And now that's really important, right? Because Johnny in this example is starting at nine, whereas the adult who's starting at 31, that's 31 minus nine, we're talking 22 extra years. So even at that 7%, we're saying it's gonna double twice extra Johnny's getting. He's getting two extra doubles of this money. That's the critical piece here. So that's kind of just a cool mental framework to think about when you're contemplating your own investments, right? So like if you have a million dollars at 40, 
you would expect that to double. Again, if you're expecting a 7% return, you'd expect that to double every 10 years. So at 50, you'd have 2 million. At 60, you'd have four. At 70, you'd have eight. You know, this is, it's kind of cool to think about that, right? And I've seen articles about how like Warren Buffett's, his net worth, it's backloaded like that too. And you know, obviously there are other factors, but it's cool when you think about compounding on a big number, it adds up pretty quick. So that's, you know, yet again, kind of another one of these lessons that you can teach your child as part of this entire exercise is it really pays to put money in as early as possible and watch that compound. So, I mean, I would probably make the argument to Johnny, if you can put in that full 6,000, if there's some way to get that earned income, I mean, you could contribute just for a handful of years, probably from nine to 20 and never have to contribute again. And I suspect, though I haven't run the numbers, I suspect his net worth would be higher than had he just put in that 1500 for that entire time. Right. And the most important part of all of this is that it's going to require communication between parent and child. And the conversations that should be included is likely in some capacity trying to incentivize that that front loading of income into a retirement vehicle. Maybe try to frame it more like a hot rod, less like a station wagon. But the, the conversations that are going to be underpinning that are just one contribution makes an impact when you have time on your side. You know, and and we have a different scenarios inside this article of people doing this at different ages to help foster these conversations so you can truly communicate that to your child. But just one contribution makes an impact when you have time on your side and small contributions over time make an impact as well. So what we were trying to do is we're, we're trying to incentivize them to break through the resistance of just getting started and maybe get through your own personal resistance of going through the trouble to help them start this. But just get it started, recognizing that just you getting it started is likely immediately going to add an additional hundred thousand, several hundred thousand dollars onto their retirement number just because you took the time to have that initial conversation, make that setup, force that first contribution, and they'll benefit for the rest of their life. And then how do we build on that? It's a much easier conversation once you've done that to start layering on these small contributions over time. That system took a little bit of friction to get that in place. Now you have a system, now you can start. Uh, working on reinforcing these habits. It's a much easier ask. And one of the things that you're doing, regardless of your own means and financial background, by having this conversation, we're allowing our child to build their own trust fund. We don't want trust fund babies. We want kids that can build trust funds for themselves and for their next generation. I mean, think about how that changes their options as an adult. You know, how do they really, and, and we don't need to worry about what are they going to do with the silver spoon because they made their own silver spoon. They're a creator, not a consumer, almost by definition, you know, the, the psychological component, Brad, this is something that you lean on all the time. The psychology of teaching your kids early about investing, it's hard to put a price tag on that. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, they then are set up to make good decisions. You know, all those intervening years when a lot of us were just fumbling around in the darkness, you know, just trying to figure this out on our own and a little bit of knowledge, then, you know, again, it's compounding, right? Like then they're prepared the next time they, or they, somebody's talking about something financially related, they at least have a foundation, right? And then it probably increases the likelihood that they're going to understand that and want to learn that next thing and the next thing and the next thing. And it all just compounds on each other. So I think getting started here early, as early as possible. And, you know, realistically, it might not be possible for everybody out there to set up their kids for life here, but it doesn't have to be, okay, I've got to put every dollar of their earned income in a Roth IRA because Jews of I said, I mean, that, that's clearly not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the lessons are priceless and you obviously have to figure out what your life situation looks like in this example of Johnny, like, Okay, maybe Johnny can only put in a couple or only wants to put in a couple hundred dollars of his own money that year and you can't match it at all. Okay, that's very realistic for most people, right? And if you can match, then wonderful. You get to teach another lesson. But if not, it doesn't mean this is all for naught or you shouldn't do it. Clearly, it's just, okay, that's the reality now. And I think then, you know, what's the next lesson you can teach? I think that's and Jonathan, obviously I'm far from a perfect parent, but like, that's what I'm always looking for with my kids is like, what's that next age appropriate lesson I can teach them to get them interested, to get them thinking about money as a tool and not just something to spend frivolously. Yeah. And uh, you know, as you start to 
think about what are the lessons that my child are, are learning. And as they're going through these different age brackets, really the psychology of money, as you start thinking about a young mind, there's some very age specific lessons that they are going to be able to grasp and they're going to handle and they're going to be able to do it in a much more well-balanced and comprehensive way because you're fostering these conversations. This article actually takes the time to kind of break down a few of those lessons at various you know age brackets. But the one that really strikes me for all of us is that when our children are earning money, they are not earning money for subsistence, right? They're not earning money sir, for survival. Not only would that be illegal basically at that point, but they are earning money, hopefully from a place of privilege. So we need to then, if we're going to reinforce this, it's not for survival. It's going to be really helpful for us to start looking at this as an opportunity to teach them time value of money, right? Time is your most precious non-renewable resource. And so if we can start to help them make associations between their time and the money they're earning, then it starts to allow us to establish this idea of reaching and going for financial independence as a worthy goal. And so you are going to need to like, you know, think about this through the age that they are and help them, you know, work through that. But what a fantastic platform to do that. And we're talking about this idea of making your kid a millionaire. So just consider this article a springboard. I think you need to spend more time just going through this article, thinking through the concepts, how it applies to your children. If you want a much more, you know, a larger framework outside of this, I would highly recommend that you take a look at the book Raising a Money Savvy Family for Next Generation Financial Independence. That was written by Nords and Carol uh, and through Chooseify Publishing. It is an absolutely phenomenal just framework for having these conversations at all ages. And you can find that at chooseify.com slash books. Or again, just using this article as a framework, just go to chooseify.com slash 319. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. If this episode was helpful to you, don't forget to subscribe. If you want to help spread the word, please give us a five-star review and tell your friends about us. We can be found on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and anywhere you listen to podcasts. While you're there, don't forget to check out our other shows like Everyday Courage with Jillian Johnsrud and Rebel Entrepreneur with Alan Dalmigan. If you would like a free bite-sized course to jumpstart your financial independence, check out chooseify.com slash challenge. Chooseify is produced by Andrew Mendonza and Zachary Tan and is a production of Chooseify Media Incorporated. Chooseify.com is managed by Annie Sheely with William McVeigh, M.K. Williams, Melissa Lagerquist, Liz Kessler, Stephen Hettig, Kelly Black, and Jennifer Ma. And Ed T. is our CEO. Thanks for listening.